in my Better Brain book, we uh, classify people into three tiers. And if you carry the APOE4 allele, you're tier three, you're the worst tier. And that's why these people need the highest levels of antioxidants. And we develop programs for people who carry the APOE4 allele. Uh, you can measure the degree of brain activation, people who have APOE3 versus APOE4, and you see higher levels of activation in the top column of people carrying APOE4. The brains are working harder. This is actually measuring mitochondrial activity. Those mitochondria are working as fast as they can because they're dysfunctional. Uh, and here is another image of it. The, more, the, the greater your risk for mitochondrial dysfunction comes with carrying that APOE4 allele. You should know your APOE status. It's an important part of, of the test. Again, on the brain panel that uh, we've developed, um, APOE uh, genotype is something everyone needs to know, along with C-reactive protein and homocysteine. You can actually look at T-bars, thiobarbituric acid reductase substances, which are a measurement of nitric, uh, of damage to fat from free radicals. We'll leave it at that. And in the temporal lobes of Alzheimer's patients, they have huge amounts of T-bars, of, of fat being damaged by free radicals. You can check a person's fat damage by free radicals by a simple urine test called urine lipid peroxides, which should be something doctors should do. This is something that can be carried in a pharmacy. It's non-prescription. You can carry a, a, a urine lipid peroxide test in your pharmacy and people can take it and learn how well their daily dosage of antioxidants are doing in terms of protecting their bodies against free radicals. Uh, if you look at damage to the DNA, in, in, um, which we measure with 8-OHDG, it's offered by laboratories. The average 8-OHDG or DNA damage from free radicals in Alzheimer's is 5 compared to 3 in the controls. Well, why is it? Uh, perhaps Alzheimer's patients have lower levels of antioxidants, and indeed that's absolutely true. If you measure antioxidant levels, and you have this, I think, in your syllabus, they have lower levels of various types of antioxidants compared to control populations. What does it tell us? Uh, even looking at vitamin C and vitamin E, we're not talking about real aggressive pharmaceutical things here. But these findings suggest that these lymphocyte 8 ohdg DNA damage, in Alzheimer's disease is a result of increased oxidative stress related to poor antioxidant status. Simply stated that the DNA damage happening in the Alzheimer's patients is because their antioxidants are not up to snuff. This is important information because this gives us a clue that maybe we can prevent Alzheimer's. Well, how about looking at risk for Alzheimer's in people based upon their vitamin C and E. We're not talking about something exotic here. <clears throat> We're not talking about uh, resveratrol um, or vinpocetine or CoQ10 or NAC or lipoic acid. We're talking about vitamin C and E. And this study published in the Archives of Neurology, that comes from the American Medical Association, found that individuals who took vitamin C and E, 500 of C and 400 of E, had a reduced prevalence of Alzheimer's by 78%. Now, why did that not make front page news? Why did CNN not break this article? What is the impetus for people to look at this? I mean, who owns vitamin C and E? No one owns it. So you can't, there won't be um, uh, an ad on uh, the evening news talking about vitamin C and E. But this is what the peer review literature provides us. You know, sometimes people like myself get criticized because, oh, this isn't evidence-based, it's not peer review. In fact, I once went to, um, I gave a series of lectures in Michigan. One of them was at a hospital. They canceled my lecture because it wasn't evidence-based peer review. They didn't want the doctors to hear this left-wing radical kind of stuff that I'm presenting. This comes from the Archives of Neurology, which is a journal that they should be reading instead of just the ads. Anyway, I mean, statistics, we have to look at these numbers. And I guess you can look at them in various ways. For example, uh, there's one statistic that says that four out of five people suffer from hemorrhoids. Now, you could say, well, that means that one out of five people enjoys the hemorrhoids. That's one way of interpreting it. <laughs> so, I mean, you can always look at these statistics and read into them as you want. But this is what we're told to do. Um, this is what we're told to do, right? Aricept. This is the drug of choice. I'm sure you guys carry it, thonepazil. Uh, and, you know, here you have a grandmother. You see it as maintaining cognitive function. She sees it as a bedtime story. I mean, the grandmother is reading something to the grandchild, and I think the grandchild is probably saying to herself, what the heck is she talking about? 
But nonetheless, this is where doctors learn what to do. And you, as a, f- a family member of an Alzheimer's patient, will come to my office and say, I want my mother or grandmother to have that Aricept that I saw last night. Because this, is, this really works, doesn't it? It doesn't work at all. This study from Lancet was the first study, you have it there, the first peer-reviewed double-blind placebo study published ever on Donepazil that was not paid for by its manufacturer. And they found that it doesn't work. Here's what they found. It does no measurable reduction in the rate of institutionalization or progress of disability. No measurable prog- uh, reduction in progress of disability. Lancet. We would all agree that's probably one of the top three most well-respected journals in the world, along with New England Journal and maybe the British Medical Journal. It is not cost-effective with benefits below minimally relevant thresholds. That's what the evidence-based peer-reviewed science tells us about this drug. The findings of disappointingly little overall benefit from Donepazil cannot be taken lightly. Now, this was published back in 2004, and I hung my hat on this study for quite a long time, but it was only one study. The British Medical Journal in the fall of 2005, in other words, two months ago, three months ago, came out with a a report and looking at cholinesterase inhibitors for patients with Alzheimer's, looking at all cholinesterase inhibitors, review of all the published double-blind placebo-controlled randomized uh, trials examining the efficacy of Aricept, Exelon, Reminil. Here's what they found. Because of flawed methods and small clinical benefits, the scientific basis for recommendations of these drugs in the treatment of Alzheimer's is questionable. This is the British Medical Journal. It just came out. Here's what they're, this is the takeaway. The recommendations should, uh, are not evidence-based. The benefits are minimal. The methodological quality of the available trials is poor. This is what supports a billion-dollar industry. No evidence of effectiveness whatsoever. I would like to be, I wouldn't like to, but I could be making this up. But just read the journals. If you read the journals, this is what they're actually saying. My colleagues, to my colleagues, that's invisible. And this is invisible. That you can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's by 78% by giving antioxidants, based upon the understanding that Alzheimer's is a mitochondropathy, essentially. But it's all, you know, um, ignored, Henderson. It's unscientific. So, you know, you people put a blind eye. Uh, you know, I throw these cartoons in to be, you know, f- to be funny. Sometimes... Like, for example, yesterday I was seeing patients. Some, sometimes people don't really get the humor. I had a patient came in. He said, Doctor, I'm really having a problem with my shingles. And I said, well, why don't you try aluminum siding next time? And he, <laughs> shingles are things that go on the side of your house. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> let's look at, um, again, a homocysteine. And I'm, I'm throwing homocysteine in to the uh, part where we're talking about free radicals. Why would I do that? Well, uh, studies have shown that um, if you give homocysteine to these exper- in these experimental animals, it makes that MPTP toxicity worse. So there's something very toxic about homocysteine. And um, interestingly, we note in uh, Parkinson's patients who receive levodopa that they seem to get strokes more commonly than others, or Parkinson's patients in general. And interestingly, what has been found is that Patients who receive levodopa, the main, main treatment for Parkinson's disease, have an increased risk of vascular disease. And why is that? Well, what's now been demonstrated is that levodopa increases the production, uh, point number three, increases the production of uh, homocysteine, enhances conversion of uh, SAMe to homocysteine, and that might be the reason that um, Parkinson's patients have increased risk for stroke. So simply stated... Uh, homo- levodopa increases homocysteine. So this is a very important thing to consider in patients receiving levodopa therapy. I'm not saying don't use your Cinemet. I'm saying that if you do, follow the patient's homocysteine. But why do people not talk about homocysteine? Is there a patented drug that you can use to lower homocysteine? No. You simply tell people to increase their consumption of B vitamins and monitor the homocysteine. But yet when we see holes in the brains of our Parkinson's patients and wonder why that is and then check their homocysteine levels, we see that they are elevated. Homocysteine leads to multiple small strokes in the brain. Uh, And when you look at uh, plasma homocysteine and the risk for these small strokes, you find that the overall risk of having either a silent infarct, which many of us have had,